All right, my, uh, my talk today will be in honor of the dogma of Angra Manu, and that is the satanic church who challenged the state of Oklahoma on multiple grounds of religious freedom. And I know everybody in this room probably knows the whole story, but I have to preface it for people who will be watching on video. While the Supreme Court said that the state cannot erect religious icons on government property, an Oklahoma court said that that could be done if it was privately funded. So of course, representatives of the religious right immediately funded a monument to the misnamed, whoops, I'm out of sequence already, uh, the misnamed Ten Commandments. All right, and it, it initially, it, and of course, when they did this, they found a way around the law the way they usually do. Initially, secular groups, atheists, the ACLU, and so forth, weren't able to do anything about it, uh, especially since it had been endorsed by Jews, Masons, and Catholics. And it seemed, I'm sure, like a safe bet that if you allow religious citizens, or if you allow the citizens to put up their own religious icons, it's always going to be Christian because everyone here is Christian, right? Yeah, and no one expected the Satanists of Oklahoma. <laughs> they raised $25,000 to erect this statue of Baphomet at the courthouse too, next to the Ten Commandments. And uh, the state doesn't know how to say no to them because they've already set a precedent. But it gets funnier because immediately after the Satanists proposed this statue, the Hindus proposed a statue in honor of Hanuman, the monkey god. <laughs> and there was another group that also petitioned for the flying spaghetti monster. But all of that is currently suspended for two reasons. Uh, one, the state is back in court with the ACLU, led by a Baptist minister, much to his credit. Amusingly, it seems that the only way that the state can avoid having this and a whole bunch of other religious monuments dedicated to all the various religions all over their courthouse is if they remember what the First Amendment means and get rid of the Ten Commandments. The other issue is an unfortunate one. Uh, just yesterday, we got the news that some inconvenient nut job <laughs> drove his car over the Ten Commandments. <laughs> and to make matters worse, the driver confessed that he was a Satanist, obeying the commands of Satan that he heard in his head. Literally, he told the police, the devil made me do it. <laughs> he, also con he also confessed to being mentally unstable and off his medication. Uh, and last night, I contacted the Dastur of the Dakma of Angra Manu, and they said that they never heard of this guy. Uh, and his, the, the mother of the suspect who confessed said, my son wouldn't do that. So I'm sure they must have the wrong guy, right? <laughs> and she said he's a good Christian and, and all of this. So now we don't know what he is, but we know how the media will treat this. And so that's, that's not going to help the, the Satan's public image at this point, And it's not going to help our collective case either. But as I say, I came here to applaud the Satanists for what they had accomplished prior to this incident because they got a lot more attention than atheists could have. The best we could have done would have been to erect a monument to science. And most people in conservative southern states wouldn't even get it. <laughs> this scene reminds me of Moses smashing the original Ten Commandments, doesn't it? And of course, the religious right say that they're going to replace these broken tablets. And I think they should do that just like the Bible said. So that the next set talks about sacrificing your firstborn child and boiling baby goats in their mother's milk. And isn't it strange that the Satanists actually had the upper hand in this issue? That never happens. So then the devil himself sends another of his minions to thwart his own efforts? Why would he do that? It's like Satan contradicts himself as much as God does. <laughs> Moses, I want you to lead your people 
out of Egypt. But just to make it interesting, I'm also going to harden Pharaoh's heart. (laughs) The Satanists had done so well that they had even secured the right to hold their black mass in the Oklahoma City Civic Center. How great is that? And they promised to adhere to the requirements of laws and public health codes by replacing vinegar or, yeah, replacing urine with vinegar in some of their sacrilegious ceremonies. I also like that 42 people attended the Black Mass. Judeo-Christian numerology gets excited about 40 of this and 7 of that. But atheists who have read their guidebooks get a certain joy out of the number 42. (laughs) So there's only a few dozen Satanists attending the Black Mass, but there are 600 Christian protesters outside, some of which had taken charter buses in from other states. And the beautiful thing was that they were all of different denominations. So you have all these disparate Christian groups coming together against a common enemy, only to begin attacking each other over trivial differences of interpretation. And it's ironic because the Satanists are actually trying to be offensive and they can't compete with the Christians outside (laughs) and on the web. There are lots of Christian channels, we all have our favorites, that do nothing but vitriolic, prejudiced, and paranoid reactionary hatred. And it's ironic that all this happened in Oklahoma. And it's ironic that I should be speaking at a skeptics conference in Oklahoma because the very first time I was ever in this state, I happened to see a billboard like this one (laughs) along the side of the highway. Now, the irony is that when I was driving north on I-35 and I saw this sign, I was nervous because, one, I had never been to Oklahoma before, and this was exactly what I was told to expect. (laughs) But also because I happened to be wearing all of these necklaces. I had a couple of pentacles, a couple crystals, a couple pieces of hematite, and, of course, Mjolnir, Thor's hammer, with a double tourmaline quartz hammerhead. If I had gotten pulled over, I wouldn't even have gotten away with the peace symbol. Because although that is the Norse rune of the harvest, Christians told me they think that's an upside-down cross with the arms broken off. (laughs) Not kidding. Even the peace symbol is satanic to them. No wonder they spend so much in the military. These were gifts mostly from girlfriends and so forth. This was an earlier incarnation of myself from decades ago, not the man you see before you today. Most of the anti-theist speakers you're familiar with were formerly Christian. If they had any faith at all, uh, that particular religion was probably the most relevant aspect of their personality prior to rejecting their faith. Not so for me. I haven't believed in God since I was a teenager. And since then, I was more commonly associated with neo-pagan spiritualists, many of whom practiced witchcraft. Now, I'd been told that witches worship the devil, but everybody I knew who I self-identified as a witch said no. That word really only refers to devotees of pagan polytheism. And I never identified as a Wicca. Uh, I was more of a Jedi. Had I read the Tao Te Ching at that time in life, I probably would have identified as Taoist. But I sought community with pagans and pantheists and druids and so on because they were accepting and because they shared some of the beliefs that I held at that time. I once believed that all life was infused with a vital spirit, a vital force, a, like a, a life force, living spirit. Um, something that would fuse the material world to an ethereal nether world, like a, a, a collective consciousness of a biosphere. And I believed that psionic powers like telepathy and telekinesis and astral projection were all possible because of this. 
Now, before you judge me, remember that there really wasn't much of an atheist or skeptical movement back in the 1980s. You can watch old episodes of Star Trek and you'll see that pretty much everybody believed in something supernatural. So whenever, whenever anybody protested on the imposition of the religious right, they either identified as pagan or they identified as satanic. In either case, you go to the same barber. <laughs> now, let's see a show of hands. Uh, how many of you have been told by Christians that you really believe in God, you just hate him? That's the Satanists, not the atheists. Christians can't tell us apart. To be fair, atheists can't always tell the difference either. Satanism is rather like Buddhism. Some Buddhists worship the Buddha as a god, others don't. The same kind of thing occurs with different types of Satanism. And the Satanists that I knew didn't believe in God or the devil. Uh, they weren't educated intellectuals, they were like these guys. Uh, they were atheists, they just didn't know what atheist was. Nobody knew what an atheist was back then. They just knew that there was something really wrong with religion, and they wanted to get as far away from Christianity as possible, and Satanism was the only label they knew that would put them on the opposite side. We had all been told that atheists believe in nothing, as if we're all nihilists as if not believing imaginary things are real is the same thing as not believing anything is real, including yourself. Or, we were told that atheists reject any possibility of anything existing that can't be proved, which of course no reasonable person would believe. It's like when Oprah said you can't be atheist if you experience awe and wonder, as if she knows anything about that. The problem is, if everybody keeps repeating the same lie systematically for decades, people will believe it. I was an atheist for 15 years before I knew what that word meant and that it applied to me. Carl Sagan lived his whole life without realizing he was atheist too. Because he and I were fed the same lie. We were given definitions of atheism that were not only false, but very stupid. So, most atheists refer to themselves as agnostics instead. And anyone who calls themselves agnostic now is atheist. They just won't use that label because they've been conditioned to execrate it. Lying to atheists about what atheism is and smearing that label such that most atheists refuse to use it is one of the most successful suppression campaigns the religious right ever had because it keeps our demographic really low in the polls. And the fact is that if, if you don't believe that there's a magical, anthropomorphic, immortal, secretly spying on anything you ever do, then you're atheist. Even if you're agnostic about that, you're still atheist. Most atheists are agnostic. You can be an agnostic theist or a gnostic atheist, but the other way around is much more common. Sadly, being atheist does not mean you're necessarily a learned academic scholar or that you're a rational skeptical epistivist. Some atheists may believe in other forms of supernatural woo, but just not gods, because that's the only thing the definition applies to. A belief is a conviction, and a lack of belief is a lack of conviction. So if you're not convinced that an actual deity really exists, you're atheist. It really is that simple, and there's no middle ground here. You're either convinced or you're not, and whether you like it or not, if you can't profess a belief in God, then the A word applies. But we didn't know that back then. We were told that atheists were devil worshipers, and that if you didn't believe in a Christian God, then you were in league with Satan. I've often heard people say that if it didn't come from God, it's of the devil. And when I was a kid, everything was of the devil. Sex and drugs and anything that tasted good or felt good or made life interesting or fun, the devil did it all. So 
We listened to what they told us was the devil's music, and we sold our soul for rock and roll. And that's my story. Even though I don't believe in Satan, I've been repeatedly accused of worshiping him because I was running with the devil on the highway to hell and breaking the law with no remorse. But worse than that, yeah, worse than all that is back then, I played Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> And for anyone who doesn't get that joke, possibly watching on video, there was a time when the religious right went after D&D nerds, warning that if you play this game, it would get you in allegiance with Satan. And as you can imagine, the criticism that I get from Christians today seldom get past my appearance. According to their typical bigoted stereotypes and playground level limits of wit, but they apply this same generalization to everyone. For example, this is my friend Jerry DeWitt. He was the first participant in the Clergy Project, what is now a long list of lifelong ministers who've come to realize they don't believe in all this indefensible nonsense anymore. But Jerry still believes in community and fellowship. Even if, there's no, even if he can't pretend there's a God, there are still people, and people need people, and Jerry's all about that. But any time anyone realizes that the emperor has no clothes, then the wanna believers react by going on a witch hunt, especially in Louisiana. So a few weeks ago, Jerry started getting hate mail. And I don't know if you can read it at the top. It says that Jerry has the ability to drive away the one true God. Imagine Max von Sydow in The Exorcist saying, the power of Jerry compels you. If I believed in God, and I believed that Jerry could drive God away, I wouldn't be sending him hate mail. <laughs> but they are, and it actually says in the letter that if he doesn't allow the love of this hate mail to filter through, if he doesn't learn to love a despicable despot who damns everyone, or if he doesn't make believe contradictory nonsense attributed to an imaginary being, then the God's oh-so-mysterious work will be done by these anonymous losers in Louisiana. Because God can't do anything by himself. He's so pathetic that he needs the aid of superstitious minions who can't even write at the eighth grade level. <laughs> they even told him not to go to the police. And I think that may be they suspect the police have chariots of iron. <laughs> the point is, is that Jerry doesn't, ever they know, they know Jerry doesn't believe in God or the devil, yet they still accuse him of being a satanistic devil worshiper. And that's because the devil put all the evidence there to fool men into not believing in God, right? The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was to convince the world he doesn't exist. A creationist told me that if my argument begins to make sense, it is only because the devil is talking through me, for he is the Lord of lies. Another one told me that if I didn't believe in the devil, it meant that I worshipped him. And I, I said, how do you figure? He said, well, the devil is mentioned in the Bible, and the Bible is the word of God. So if you don't believe in the Bible, you don't believe in God. And God says, you're either with me or you're against me. So if you don't believe in God, that means that you believe in the devil. You worship the guy you don't believe in. I said he had a dizzying intellect. <laughs> and then I said, I don't believe in Daffy Duck either. Does that mean I worship him too? So if you don't believe in the Bible, you don't believe in God. That doesn't just apply to atheists. That means that if you believe in any other God besides the Christian God, you're going to get the same treatment. I've even seen Christians refer to Muslims as atheists, because if they don't believe in their God, then it's like they don't believe in any God at all. And according to Christians, every other religion is somehow guided by the devil. So, I took my kids to a Christian, or excuse me, to a Krishna 
temple because I wanted them to know that there were twice as many Hindus in the world today as there are Protestant Christians. And the next day we were in some little store that was selling incense by the register. And I pointed out to my kids, hey, that's Krishna on the package. And someone else in the grocery line said, yeah, she wanted to know what we were talking about. And as soon as she realized that I was talking about another religion, she threw up her hands and said, if it ain't from Jesus, it's of the devil. <laughs> and that's what her religion teaches. This is one page out of one of those ignorant and bigoted religious tracts that people stick under your windshield wipers. As you can see, it says that Satan created all of the gods of India, which is a pretty good trick, considering that, in, that Hinduism is the oldest religion in continuous practice, predating Satan and the religion he comes from. Vedic scripture predates even the oldest books of the Bible. And the same is true of the gods of Greece, Egypt, and the Near East. There was a time when no one believed in heaven or hell, the Jewish God, or the Christian devil. Instead, many of these older religions, including the religions of ancient Israel, believed that when anyone dies, their soul would descend into the underworld of the dead. And they all seem to have the same idea. Here we see it represented by a modern interpretation of Pluto, also known as Hades, except that the Greeks didn't consider Hades to be an evil overlord. He was just the ruler of the least glamorous realm. It wasn't yet a place of judgment. It didn't matter who you were or how you lived. Everyone went to the same labyrinthine underworld. Then, when the Hebrew scriptures were translated into Greek around 200 BC, the word Hades was changed to the word Sheol, and the land of the dead became the land of the evil dead. But the earliest representation of what would become the modern concept of hell was the Sumerian version of the kingdom of the dead. The ruler of this domain was believed to be Ereskigal, goddess of darkness, gloom, and death. And she was said to be frightfully evil, but somehow her rule was overthrown by Nergal, god of war and pestilence. Through a strange set of circumstances, Nergal was born in the kingdom of the dead and eventually raped Eris Gigal, taking her as his wife, because that's how it was done back then. Rape was a prelude to matrimony, and that's the kind of shoddy morality that found its way into the Bible. Eventually, Nergal was depicted as a judge of the dead souls, and so we have the first hints of the torment by the beast in the pit. But none of these characters are the same as Satan, the devil. So where did this character come from? Because whenever I look at these older images, all of them contradictory, I get the impression someone just made this up. I recently posted videos from David Fitzgerald and Richard Carrier, both historians, Bible scholars and experts on ancient mythology, and they say that Jesus never existed. And I, last month I testified before the Texas State Board of Education to the effect that Moses evidently never existed either, that he was uh, a, evidently an embellished composite of four older characters. And I'm afraid I have to say much the same thing about the Christian devil. For example, we know that Beelzebub the Lord of the Flies, is a New Testament bastardization of Baal Zebul, the Lord on high, and ruler of the city of Ugarit around 1500 BC. Scholars acknowledge that this was a deliberate distortion of his name, and we know that happened, and it happened a lot. For example, Christians like to say that Lucifer was a fallen angel, uh, but that story is a mistaken interpretation accidentally adapted from another culture. Isaiah 14 was not talking about Satan. He was criticizing Babylonian astrology in which the planet Venus, also known as the Morning Star, played the role of a prominent pagan god named Athtar, or Hillel bin Shahar. The name translates as Lucifer. Uh, Jesus was also known as Lucifer, the light bringer. And one of the earliest Christian denominations were the Luciferians. But in this case, Lucifer refers to a rebellious prince, the son of Shahar, the dawn, brother of Shalim, the dusk. These are the twin sons 
of L. And that makes, and, and L is the original god of Semitic people, typically personified as the sun. And this means that Lucifer is the grandson of God. He also had dozens of uncles, none of whom were, main, were named Jesus. Oh, how you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. The most important part of Christian theology regarding the devil is based on this one passage, and they've got the wrong guy. The problem is, is that Christians too often read into the Bible things that it does not say, and then they don't read what it does say. It's like they read between the lines and then don't read the lines. For example, nowhere does the Bible say that the serpent in the garden was ever supposed to be anything but a snake. Now, Christians will say that Revelation 12 refers to Satan as that old serpent. But it doesn't say it's that old serpent, not the one from the garden. Jesus referred to the Pharisees as a generation of vipers and the spawn of Satan. Does that mean they were that old serpent too? And if so, why weren't they crawling on their bellies and eating dust according to the Lord's curse? If the serpent in the garden was supposed to be Satan, then the Bible should say that right there in the first book of the Old Testament. But the first hint we get of that isn't until the last book of the New Testament, which was written in another time, in another place, in another language, by people of a completely different belief system. Not Christianity, not even Judaism. The fables in Genesis come to us from Mesopotamian mythos. And the serpent of the garden and many of the other elements of Genesis 3 first appear in the Epic of Gilgamesh, where Gilgamesh is walking through the sacred garden and happens across the dark maid Lilith. Uh, and she was living in the forbidden tree with a companion who was the serpent who could not be tamed. And that throws another kink in the mythology. Just as Christians today commonly assume that the serpent was supposed to be Satan, Christians in the Middle Ages often confused the serpent with Lilith. Who is she? She was Adam's first wife, according to Talmudic legend. And one of the stories is that Adam and Lilith were created simultaneously as equals, and she wanted to remain equal, and Adam wanted to dominate her. However, Lilith knew the secret name of God, and this gave her the ability to fly, and thus she escaped the Garden of Eden. And then, rumor has it that she apparently snuck back into the garden, found Adam with the younger woman, and then adopted the guise of a snake. And we think this because in virtually every rendering of that age, the serpent is depicted as a woman. This one is from a 15th century manuscript. Uh, here's a couple more from the same period. Sometimes you only see a woman's head. And these came from all the mainstream sources at that time. Duke de Berry depicted his as a naga, half woman, half snake. Raphael did the same thing. And uh, Hieronymus Bosch made his serpent into a lizard lady. These were religious men, these artists. These were Christians, believing Christians. But this image of the female serpent shows up in churches too, big important ones, like this stone relief on the walls of Notre Dame Cathedral and even the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel by Michelangelo. So this naga, this half woman, half snake, does that like, look like Satan to you? Clearly, the unsupported interpretations of modern Christians is not the same as that of many mainstream Christians back in the day. Now, the modern adaptation of Genesis, of Genesis 3 <laughs> comes to us from Babylonian priests around 450 BC. Twice it says that the serpent was created as a wild animal, and it says that he was cursed to crawl on his belly all of the days of its life. So it's a mortal animal as well. Not possessed by Satan, but acting on its own accord because it was smarter than the other beasts. And that's why it was cursed. 
It also can't be the Lord of lies either, because if you remember in that story, the serpent was the only one who told the truth while God lied. And even if we combine all these unrelated fables into a single narrative, the book of Job still follows after Genesis, and Satan is said to be walking there, not crawling on his belly or eating dust. In fact, Satan is a servant of God. They're shown as if they were friends who never had a falling out, which wouldn't even be possible if, the, if Satan were previously the serpent. This is also the only time when Satan ever does anything evil, and he does so only under the will of God, because he made a bet with an omniscient being. And God's only excuse for that? The devil made him do it. Other than that, what's the worst thing Satan ever did? He tried to reason with Jesus. Don't try to use reason on these people. They consider it evil. You ever try to reason with a devoutly religious person, one who thinks that God thinks he's really special and who actually hears the voice of God talking to him? This is why we are lumped together with the Satanists. God and Satan didn't have a falling out until the book of Zechariah. And there, Satan is still an agent of God and is not only standing, but standing on the right hand of the angel of God to accuse Joshua, because that's who Satan really is. Ha-Satan, the accuser. Diablos. I think Hasatan was the enemy, and Diablos is the accuser. And this idea is based on the Zoroastrian concept of Araman the Opposer, also known as Angramanyu. And this is actually the patron deity of the Oklahoma Satanists. So, Zoroastrianism is the oldest monotheistic religion. The Persian prophet Zoroaster established this religion by at least the 6th century BC, if not earlier, prior to the development of rabbinic Judaism. Before then, the religions of ancient Israel were previously polytheist. And according to the Jewish encyclopedia, most scholars, Jewish as well as non-Jewish, are of the opinion that Judaism was strongly influenced by Zoroastrianism with striking parallels apparently adapted by every Abrahamic faith thereafter, meaning that Christians and Muslims both adopted theology from the prophet of a different god. And one of the ideas to originate with Zarathustra was the notion of posthumous punishment and damnation. Righteous men would ascend to the kingdom of justice and truth under the wise lord Ahura Mazda, while evil men would descend into the kingdom of the lie, ruled by Araman the opposer, also known as Ha-Satan, the Satan. And this description of the underworld uh, was not only the first literature in all of history to, uh, to reference an eternal judgment after death, but was also said to be populated by evil divas. This is not the way the Bible describes hell. This depiction comes from Dante's Inferno and subsequent works that, uh, in movies and such, that show the devil ruling over hell. But that's not what Christian theology says. According to Revelations, Jesus is the one crushing the unbelievers in the bloody wine press. But everyone thinks there's a devil punishing sinners in hell as if he's a prison warden working for God. But looking at this image, and every other depiction of hell from Hieronymus Bosch on down, it all strikes me as utterly pointless and stupid. No superior being would ever construct a hell nor maintain it. They wouldn't condone torment as a punishment and would not permit an eternal punishment for any reason. No God worthy of worship would allow anyone to be damned according to whether or not they believed. This is not the criteria of anything that is really real. This is, a re this is required of liars who want you to believe that it's real because they want to believe it themselves. And they can't maintain their own delusion if they allow you to question it or because they can't exert force if they can't evoke fear. And a number of Christians have told me that long after they rejected their religious beliefs, they held on to this lingering fear of hell. 
But honestly, hell was one of the first things I gave up because it didn't make any sense, and neither did the devil. If Satan is an enemy of God, then what is his motivation? That was my, the first question I asked when I was a little boy and my mother first told me about Satan. Because even after listening to all the Christian excuses trying to justify this guy, he is still the most unbelievable one-dimensional character I've ever heard of. Christians have not thought this through. Just look. Do they really think there's a devil that's been around for thousands of years and he's never read that book? And it's about him? Do they really think that if there is a devil, that the devil wouldn't have to know way more about all of this than every Christian? Which makes me think, there may well be a Lord of lies, and I have the evidence to prove it. Because if there was an inherent evil, such as everyone wants to believe, it would have to gather followers in order to bring in the tithe. And it would rule with the stick and the carrot, with impossible promises that can't be fulfilled, weighed against the threat of a fate worse than death for all those who didn't believe. And heresy would be damnable too. If there was a church of evil, it would be judgmental and prohibitive, inhibiting the natural drives of all its now dysfunctional devotees and would be manned by, by prejudiced and, and paranoid reactionaries perpetually ah, perpetually persecuting others while pretending to be persecuted themselves. And allowing no deviation from its mandates, the Lord of Lies would strictly restrict all forms of learning. Books would be burnt, curiosity crushed, and science attacked above all amid a perpetual war against every other religious denomination. And it would... <laughs> Vanity, jealousy, vengeance, and wrath would be the monikers of an evil deity, and this is the worst ever. It would force believers to submit to unreasonable conditions. It would order crusades, initiate inquisitions, and lead villagers on witch hunts. It would protect and promote, or permit, child abusers and molesters seeking genital mutilation. And it would manipulate the masses only to oppress them. Each of the atrocities ordered by God in the Bible is more demonic than divine. Don't give in to the lesser of two evils. Reject both. In an educated civilization where civility is based on humanity as opposed to superstition and fear, the concepts of God and the devil are superfluous. You all know who this girl is? Look at this child. Is this the face of a demon? Or is this the look of a skeptic who's not buying your bullshit? <laughs> the problem is, it's the same glare either way. And that's why we're lumped in together. This is the way we look when we realize we're being lied to. When you realize that all of the fables in the Bible began, as, began in the hearts of superstitious primitives who just made it up. It's man-made mythology and there is no truth in it. There's no heaven, no hell, no Eden either, and there is no devil. He was invented by Persians, adapted by Jews, and embellished by Christians. He was never the serpent, nor a fallen angel, and he can't steal your soul because we don't have souls. Exorcism isn't real because demons aren't real, because magic isn't real. We are not cursed. We are not fallen. We have arisen and we don't need salvation because God literally doesn't give a damn what happens after you die. Because then, neither of you exist. There is no goddamn devil because there is no God. Damn! You just die and that's it. You're not immortal. You're not eternal. And to believe otherwise is to diminish everything that you really have. Life is precious because it is short and there's nothing after it. There's no destiny, and there's no purpose beyond what you give it yourself. If you want your life to mean something, try making someone else's life meaningful. 
<laughs> Thank you. Because regardless, whatever else you believe, history will be our judge. And stop waiting and wondering about some posthumous promise or divine damnation and learn to live and love life.